Hey, um, have you guys heard of Hades? It's, uh... Yeah, it's pretty good. Some of you might remember about a year ago that I decided, very much on a whim, to try out Supergiant's latest, which had just entered Steam Early Access. Even with it being a very incomplete version, it still snaked its tendrils around me nice and tight and wound up being my game of the year of 2019 when all was said and done. Hades then went through a lot of changes, adding more characters, story, weapons, and mechanics until it reached version 1.0 and was officially out of early access and got a surprise release on the Switch as well. This, of course, heralded in a deluge of new fans and the accompanied internet fervor that occurs whenever a cool thing comes out that's filled to bursting with the hottest hotties. It then very much broke through that layer of general obscurity that most games in early access are veiled under. It's not all that dissimilar to Zangrius ascending to a higher plane within the underworld, but instead of finding Elysium, he was greeted with oodles of fan art ships and an endless parade of memes. But in that same Game of the Year video, I only lightly touched upon what makes this game so special, and since then, I really haven't had the opportunity to gather my thoughts on the complete package. Until now. There are some very specific things I want to go through here, but first, yeah, Yes, Hades combat is snappy, impactful, and teeming with thousands of possible builds. And yeah, the music is incredible and features so many sexy bass lines that it should be illegal. Oh, there's fishing, and the art direction is sublime and brimming with so much detail that you, well, you, you get my point. So for this video, I want to highlight the less obvious things about what Supergiant has achieved here. So grab your most potent boons, favored infernal arms, and your most treasured keepsake, and allow me to tell you why I like the thing. Uh, I can't live this charade any longer. Up until about like two years ago, I wasn't even sure what a roguelike was, and to be honest, I still might not be 100%. I like when my genres make what they are abundantly clear. Beat-em-ups, boomer shooters, and of course, jumpin' boppas. But with Supergiant's pedigree, coupled with Hades' obviously strong art direction, plus its focus on the Greek pantheon of gods, was enough to entice me. However, if this game was just that, merely a stylish look and a solid bedrock of mythology, well, that wouldn't have been enough to garner all the praise it's been amassing. It goes far, far deeper than that, because the design decisions on display here have made it so that even the most ardent shouts of I don't fuck with roguelikes have turned into It's, it's 4.13 AM. Just, uh, fuck it, one more run. See, the most common criticism that tends to pop up regarding the subgenre is that a lot of people, myself included, simply aren't into the concept of losing really good weapons or buffs they've amassed upon death when they start anew. And largely, Hades doesn't change that, but it makes deaths almost, some might say, even more engaging than the dungeon crawl in itself. What sets apart Supergiant's work from its contemporaries, like let's say, Dead Cells, an incredible action game in its own right is that once you've gotten as far as you can and the last vestiges of your life slip away, you are then treated to a menagerie of wonderful characters and plot lines once you've again risen from the pool of blood. Oh, cheers for that, Meg. Within the dour hallways of the God of the Dead's home, you'll then make progress in a different way, scuttling across the nuanced web of the underworld's gods, both demi and full, learning more about what drives each one, as well as how they relate to our hero Zagreus. It's in the moment you return after a failed run that you can still feel a sense of progression. The more you interact with Achilles, Thanatos, or Nyx, it changes things ever so slightly elsewhere within the game. It makes it so that Zag's socializing is just as important as what weapon he'll be taking into Tartarus or choosing between health, offense, or defense. That isn't to say that the game forces you to interact with these characters, but if you do choose to ignore them, you'll be making the game much harder for yourself for no real reason. Sure, it's not advisable, but the game lets you do that. 
Now, just looking at videos, we can all tell that the moment-to-moment -moment hacking and or slashing of Hades has its own brilliant design decisions that just... I, I die. Okay, I love this part. A heavenly boon or buff awaits you every time you start a run, and it's randomly bestowed by one of the Olympian deities. This will then set the tone for your ascent to each lair, and along the way you'll be bestowed with other boons that could very well complement or even replace that initial power if you so choose. Soon after that, you'll be presented with the first split in your path, each route promising tantalizing new possibilities. One room can lead to Charon, the Stygian boatman and his shop that has wares for sale if you have the coin, and another might grant you Daedalus's hammer, which can drastically change the way your weapon behaves. This may in turn lead to a lot of Sophie's Choice style moments, but not in the example that I just gave. <laughs> the answer is always hammer. Once you start getting a handle of your chosen weapon, weapon, you'll be able to unlock more of them. Then the ability to physically manifest a god's power into the battlefield becomes available. And once you've stocked up enough titan blood, you can then reveal your armory's full potential. And then duo boons become a thing and it goes on and on like this. The game very slowly introduces these mechanics to you, so it's not an overwhelming mess of menus and percentages. This is another big factor into why I think Hades has been so successful in luring in new fans. They don't assault the player with too much information all at once. It's through these facets that it creates this addictive loop of gameplay that never really has a dull moment, or a true sense of loss of progression. Even after a failed run, you'll always be bringing back a few resources with you, whether it be gifts for whoever you're crushing on, darkness to permanently increase Zag's stats, or gemstones, which lets you commission changes throughout the underworld. Okay, right, so let's say you still somehow fail to bring back any of those resources. Simply fighting will then fill out your codex, where you can then learn more lore about your weapons, enemies, or the various locations within Hades. Every single escape attempt will ultimately net you something. All of these systems have been tinkered with and polished over the course of more than a year, from the time Hades spent on the Epic Game Store and Steam Early Access, including fan feedback, which resulted in about as much balance as one could hope for. So it's no surprise that the marriage between narrative and gameplay is tightly woven, but still somehow independent from each other. While a lot of what Hades does isn't new in any sort of drastic sense, it's these design choices that are so well thought out, so expertly crafted, that you feel like you're playing something unique, which is what separates a merely good game from a special one. Now, while it's obvious that strong design is the key thing here, there's other ingredients to the nectar of Hades that make it so potent and rich. A bottle of nectar. Who should I get this to? Well, how was your wanton ransacking of my domain? Greetings, Father. My ransacking was a delight, thank you for asking. So I'll just be on my way again. When you decide to dip your sandal-clad toe into Greek mythology, you're going to be dealing with uh, a pretty large cast. And with so many of them, you'd think there'd be some lamos. Well, I mean, there are. But overall, these are the most interesting interpretations of the gods I've ever seen. So it doesn't come as a surprise that writing for so many characters is nothing short of a, I'm sorry, Herculean task. I'm actually not sorry. And that's what I want to discuss now, writing, something that Supergiant has been excelling in ever since they released their first game. I mean, off the bat, the sheer girth of the script has to be monstrous, as there's so much unique dialogue that I haven't heard it all, and I'd be surprised if anyone has. So many events and choices influence these interactions between gods, so you can definitely complete a few runs of the game without seeing every single one. The key thing here is that each character is also very clearly written to be well, their own character. Every single one has a particular style of speech or quirk that if you were to remove the voice acting and specific names, you'd still know exactly who they are just by the raw text. Not one of them spouts generic lines that feel interchangeable with others, which tends to happen a lot in video games. You'd better not be giving me the runaround, old man. Leave me alone! 
I'm busy. The animosity between Hades and Zagreus is especially unique, as it never really feels like downright hatred, but something like far more complex. A mutual disrespect or vitriolic acknowledgement? You're trying to guilt me into funding the exorbitant furnishings you desire. Perhaps once we are finished with repairs for all the carnage you have sown throughout my realm, then we might finally have time for all the needed renovations that have piled up. Nice. All I can say for sure is that the relationship is at somewhat of the core of the narrative. You're trying to escape him after all, but yet it's handled pretty subtly when, you know, compared with stuff like... Zeus. Zeus! Let's take another example. Nyx is a benevolent but still distant entity, for lack of a better term, and mother figure to Zagreus. She's immensely powerful, her speech is unlike any other, and while she cannot reveal her true intentions or desires publicly, in a few choice moments you can see her emotions just barely manifesting. Oh my dear child, so now you know, so now you know, but only half the truth. I can explain the rest, so please, it never was my wish to hurt you. This type of nuance permeates throughout the rest of the cast. Yes, even Theseus. Ah, uh, a naked attempt to sway me. Actually, no, not Theseus. Fuck, fuck Theseus. This same quality in writing also carries over to the Codex, where tons upon tons of lore is kept safe and sound. As you progress through the game, you'll fill out entries on just about everything. Even the most innocuous stuff, like just how miserable Asphodel is, or what exactly is that on Chaos? What is that? All of these descriptions feel like they came straight out of any Greek epic, which is a testament to all the research and work put in by Greg Cassavan. Overall, the writing manages to maintain a classical feel to it while still coming across as something with a modern flair, as cliché as that may sound. Character dialogue doesn't take itself too seriously, as you're never far away from a delightfully devilish insult or cheeky remark. The House of Hades. That dark and lavishly appointed lair of the underworld's king is home not just to him, but to his willful progeny. You know I can hear you, old man. The narrative also manages to avoid being too dark or too jokey, and actually achieves that oh-so-rare balance, which is something I think you'll agree is a bit of a running theme when talking about Hades. But for as good as the writing is, you also need incredible voice acting to complement it. And as it just so happens... <laughs> voice acting almost never gets the credit it truly deserves, as advancements in facial and performance capture have equalized a lot of the aspects of what goes into a believable emotive character. So, when you have any type of game that relies on one still picture for a main character, the actor behind the voice then has to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Such is the case with Hades. Each god or denizen of the underworld has such distinct designs that a suitable voice needs to be attached to it. And boy, are they ever. Logan Cunningham, who played the narrator in Bastion, is certainly the MVP here, because while many will recognize him as salty old hell dad, Hades himself, he flexes the old vocal cords by also giving life to Poseidon, Charon, Asterius, Achilles, and the storyteller as well. Dude brings his A-game to pretty much everything Supergiant has had him do, and the range he displays here is truly impressive. Surely all those who once defied my brothers and myself would much prefer a post within my house over eternity within the lowest depths of Tartarus. I want your love of history to grow, not just your love of warfare. Besides, maybe you can finish out the rest of it. I mentioned Nyx earlier in regards to the game's writing, and to voice such a role mustn't have been an easy task, as her nature demands a certain repression of feelings. Even with this restriction, however, Jamie Landrum plays her with such subtlety it's actually astounding. You know your father does not like it when Nectar is doled out on the premises, dear child. However, I am not he. And I wished, regardless, to provide you a token of my affection. In addition, Jamie also pulls double duty by playing the goddess of the hunt, Artemis. 
However, I have to give a special shout out to a particular actress that made me and many others feel things simply through the power of her voice. Avalon Penrose, awesome name, has caused tingles to undulate down the spine or in any parts of the body of anyone who speaks to Megara, the first roadblock in Zag's quest. Ever stubborn, aren't you? Maybe my whip might make you reconsider whatever it is that you're attempting here. Just, uh, I don't know what it is. It could be the slight modulation or the step on you energy she projects, but just, yeah. Hey, uh, what's that you're drinking, Meg? Anything good? Whatever it is, it's weak. Enough to be mistaken for your blood. Then we have Zagreus slash Skelly himself, I never would have guessed that, Darren Korb, who obviously has the lion's share of dialogue and perhaps the hardest job of them all. It's always difficult to play the protagonist, and especially one like Zag, as you're going to be hearing him the most, and thankfully, it was always a pleasure. He's played in such a way where he never feels too arrogant nor too heroic. There's a depth to him that slowly unravels as more characters are encountered. Whether he's being snarky, serious, inquisitive, or even hurt, there's a true sincerity in how Korb plays him that's worthy of any Greek tragedy. You mean Megara? She's on my case, all right. Under strict orders not to let me out of Tartarus. I guess that means you've got yourself a break. About damn time they gave one to you, sir. Um, Nix, you've done so much for me, I thought you might like this. There's only one heavenly archer I know of. Well, several, really. Anyway, in the name of Hades, Olympus, I accept this message. All right, let's give it another shot. All of this goes to show just how much performance truly matters, especially when a game is using still images to convey its character's emotion. So having such a talented cast play these larger-than-life deities was certainly a boon to Supergiant. And thanks to Solo here, and of course, Higgins, Regis, and Marzipan for all your hard work. Aww. Hades is something that comes along very rarely. An example of a game being so well designed and so polished that it's able to convert people who otherwise wouldn't have touched the genre with a 10-foot pole. Hell, it worked on me and has worked for a number of you that have said as much to me either on my Twitter or in my YouTube comments. That said, just because a particular genre might be outside your regular comfort zone, that doesn't necessarily mean you might not wind up loving it. Hell, it even resulted in this happening. Wow, this game is fan-fucking-tastic. I'm really glad I discovered it, right? There's nothing like discovering a game that nobody else has ever mentioned of or played. To be the first one to finally figure a true diamond-in-the-rough sort of game experience and to have it be so enjoyable. Hades is a reminder that video games can still be very special when the right one comes along, made by the right people, and that in turn can make you fall in love with the medium all over again. However, that doesn't mean this game has to be that for you. Not every single person will be into it, and that's fine. But what this does is bring to light the fact that everyone has that one magical game that really speaks to them. And in such a year of trials, tribulations, and disappointments, it's nice to be reminded of that sometimes. So I hope you enjoyed this video, have a safe and happy holiday, and with that, my fellow shades, I hope I've adequately explained why I like the thing. Sure.